I want to talk about expectations. Uh, this is real tricky. You gotta watch it when we conceive expectations about something, because uh, you can be disappointed very easily. Uh, so better to keep our expectations low, let the good be a surprise, that's my motto. Uh, but anyway, look, especially when it comes to the things of God, especially when it comes to the ways of God, gotta surrender our expectations a little bit. Uh, you know, we're backseat drivers. We like to, you know, sit there and tell God what to do. According to our thinking, uh, what we think he should do. Uh, but uh, God has his own plans and purpose. You gotta just chill out and relax in the backseat and quit trying to drive the dang car of salvation history. Like he knows what he's doing. Just let him drive. Okay. Christianity is a received religion. God is the initiator. We are the receiver. We have to work with what's been given, with what we've received, with God's initiative, with his plan and purpose that has been disclosed to us in salvation history. Uh, we have to adapt to it. Not adapt God to our thinking. Okay, God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Uh, high as the heavens are above the earth. Isaiah says in chapter 55, very important uh, to understand that about God and get real humble and quit trying a Monday morning quarterback with God. So there we are in this uh, gospel today. The people are in expectation. You only find that little phrase in Luke, in Luke's account of John the Baptist's ministry. He describes the people at that moment. Right before our Lord launches his public ministry, what is the situation? The people are in expectation. Because there's a lot of mysterious prophecies. There's like 300 or more prophecies foretelling the coming of the Son of God into this world in the Old Testament. Some of them very explicit. Some of them like in Daniel chapter 2, chapter 9, especially in this prophecy of the 490 years. It's about, it's about to go down. Okay, just do the math. Uh, the people were in expectation because of the prophecies. Something was about to happen. They knew it. So what's so interesting, though, is that, uh, you know, they can't see very clearly at this point. We have the benefit of knowing what happened. This is at the outset of our Lord's public ministry. Nothing has happened yet. Publicly, at least. Um <clears throat> He hasn't begun his public ministry. There is no Paschal mystery yet. Hasn't unfolded yet. So all they have to work with are these prophecies. And the author of Hebrews in the New Testament says, you know, these, these patriarchs and prophets, they, they greeted it from afar. You know, God disclosed, gave them little clues about what was going to happen, what he was going to do in salvation history. Namely, the coming of his son into this world was foreseen from a distance, though. Patriarchs and prophets greeted it from afar, the author of Hebrews says. You know, so it's a little hazy. Can't quite. Let's not be too harsh on these people at this time. You know, they don't know too much. The picture's a little hazy. Uh, just reading the Old Testament. They don't have the interpretive lens yet. What is the interpretive lens to understand all those prophecies? Our Lord's Paschal mystery that hasn't unfolded yet. Once we receive that and we see the events unfolded before our eyes and then we look back and say, oh my goodness, the Messiah had to suffer. And now suddenly the key just slides right into the Old Testament all the tumblers lying up and it opens up. These mysterious, uh, obscure prophecies, uh, there are many, uh, but at the same time, let's just be merciful on these people. We wouldn't be any different. Okay, so um, I want to read a passage from Isaiah here to explain something. See, God stands on the mountaintop. He already sees everything that's going to happen. We've got to realize that about God. He already knows. He's seen it from the beginning to the end. He's on the on the mountaintop. St. Thomas Aquinas uses that analogy or metaphor to explain this. It's hard for us to get this. 
But God's up on the mountaintop. He sees the whole wagon train of human history from the caboose to the engine. The whole shooting match all at once. Uh, just knowing what's going to happen doesn't cause anything to happen. Um, God knew I was going to do that from all eternity. But I did it. Okay, I freely did that. Clap my hands. That was supposed to be funny, man. It's a tough crowd today. All uh, right. Uh, look, chapter 46 of Isaiah. I love this. Isaiah is like, he, he, he's, a, he's an incredible theologian. Whoo, Isaiah. This is Mount Everest here. Uh, he says, uh, God says through the prophet Isaiah, remember the former things of old? I am God. There is no other. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done. I will accomplish all my purpose. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. He's already seen the whole thing. So interesting. It's like we think of like uh, the Old Testament prophecies and prefigurements and foreshadowings as kind of like predictive in nature. And then our Lord came and fulfilled them. And they predicted it. Actually, from God's perspective, uh, the events themselves are logically prior in the mind of God to any of these prophecies and prefigurements in the Old Testament that the patriarchs and the prophets received. God's already seen the events. He knows he's going to send his son at this particular moment in human history. And he's going to be crucified by the Romans. He's already seen the whole blasted thing. So he's disclosing to these Old Testament patriarchs and prophets little clues about what's going to happen. It's already happened in his mind. So the events come first. Are logically prior. That's an interesting way to think. You got to climb up on the mountain and think like God to understand that. You know who really gets that is uh, Pope Benedict Emeritus. Um, he says, "What is remarkable about uh, what is remarkable about these gospel accounts is the multitude of Old Testament allusions and quotations they contain. Word of God and event are deeply interwoven." The facts are, so to speak, permeated with the word, with meaning. And the converse is also true. What previously had been only word, often beyond our capacity to understand, now becomes reality, its meaning unlocked. It was not the words of scripture that prompted the narration of the facts. Rather, it was the facts themselves. At first, unintelligible, that paved the way for a fresh understanding of Scripture. Uh, I hope that uh, think about that and reflect on that. Uh, God's perspective on human history is very different. We shouldn't second guess God, and we gotta like uh, surrender our expectations a little bit. Take our, you know, sit back in the back seat and relax. God's driving this plan and he's got a purpose and he knows where he's going. Just chill. Uh, They missed it when he came. Why? Because they probably didn't line up, didn't align with their expectations of the Messiah, of the plan of God. So they flat out missed it. Particularly the religious leaders and rulers, those who were like learned professors of sacred scripture scripture scholars and they totally blew it man uh, they missed his they they did not know the time of their visitation luke says they rejected the plan of god for themselves not having been baptized by john rejected the plan of god for themselves they didn't discern the plan of god for themselves and they didn't know the time of their visitation it didn't align with their expectation All these people. 
We got to be merciful on them, okay? Because St. Paul and St. Peter are merciful. Our Lord was merciful. He understands that they, they don't know. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, okay? Can't see the hidden purposes of God, all right? St. Peter's like, you know, preaching okay, shortly after Pentecost. He's preaching in the temple, Solomon's portico. He's got a great big crowd there because he healed some dude, lame guy at the gate. And everybody's gathered around, standing there, like amazed at St. Peter. And he's like, you knuckleheads. Doesn't really say that, but says, uh, you know, look at folks, you know, why are you staring at us? Why do you wonder at this? So by our own power or piety, we made that man walk. We did it by the power of the name of Jesus of Nazareth. You know that guy? Remember that a couple few weeks ago? The guy you all hollered out, crucify him? Yeah, that guy. That's how we were able to heal this man today, by the power of his name, Jesus of Nazareth. And he's like, look at you people. You denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, namely Barabbas, and you killed the author of life. And God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. But he's like, look, I know you did that. I know you acted in ignorance, he says. You didn't know what you were doing. I know you acted in ignorance. So look, he was the promised Messiah and son of God, okay? You missed it. You didn't know the time of your visitation. It didn't match up, correspond to your expectations. But that was God's plan and purpose. You flat out missed it. But we're telling you now, the guy rose from the dead. And this is absolutely the authentic plan of God to save the human race. So repent and believe in the name of the Lord Jesus. You look at St. Paul now in Acts chapter 13, after his conversion, after his encounter with the risen Lord, he wakes up. He totally missed it. He was on the wrong track and fighting against the Son of God and persecuting him. And then he finally wakes up and he goes to this Antioch of Pisidia in modern day Turkey. And he goes into this synagogue and he's like explaining to them, you know, for those who live in Jerusalem, those people, just a few years back, five, it's been like, you know, five, six years, five, six years ago. Those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they didn't recognize him, the Messiah, the Son of God, they didn't recognize him. Nor did they understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath. And in doing so, they put him to death. And in doing that, they actually fulfilled the scriptures. Because God already foresaw that. Their rejection of him. God already saw it. They were going to hand him over to the men, to the Gentiles, to be crucified. God saw it from the beginning. And in doing those things, they just fulfilled the scriptures themselves. St. Paul says, <laughs> you try to fight God's plan or reject his purpose. You just end up getting used by God in his plan or purpose for crying out loud. He's so all powerful. He already anticipates that and works it into the plan. So uh, amazing. See how merciful Peter and Paul and our Lord are. So that's why we need to be merciful too. It's like, look, this is not easy to get, to discern the hidden purposes of God. You know, it's tricky, the prophecies and this whole thing. That's why I'm always reflecting on it all the time, trying to see God's plan. Uh, we got to lower our expectations. This is always a problem in salvation history. People having, uh, judging God according to human thinking. And you can look at Abraham, you know, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm supposed to have descendants, you tell me, like the stars of the heavens, sands of the seashore. Where are they? I'm 100 years old. God's like, look at man. You're going to have a son next spring. They laughed. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Come back next spring. Sarah's pregnant. 90 year old woman. And God's like, what's up now? Then he has Isaac. 
And then he's like, yeah, now take him uh, to Mount Moriah and I want you to uh, uh, sacrifice him. Like, what, what the? This is not part of my plan. Abraham does it, you know, and God stops him. And look, all of that was prefiguring and foretelling um, what God was ultimately going to do in sacrificing his own son. So brilliant. It's a masterpiece, God's plan. It doesn't correspond to human thinking at all. That's why it has a ring of truth about it. Authenticity. Moses comes and uh, kind of like uh, decides he's going to save Israel. And he goes, uh, sorry, he kills the Egyptian, hides him in the sand. He's going to be this conquering hero. He's going to set them free. He's going to be the man. Uh, he ends up running for his life. And then he's hiding for 40 years in the wilderness. And, he, and then God says, taps him on the shoulder at the burning bushes. Hey, I want you to go in there now. That was your plan before. Didn't work. All right. But now I want you to go in there because this is my plan. And Moses is like, ah, blah, 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 blah. I can't speak. You know, he's like all humble now. He's like, got you right where I want you. Now I can use you. Before you thought you were the man and you're going to do all this and that. And the other thing, that wasn't me. That was you. This time it's me. I'll be with you. Go on in there. And watch my plan and purpose unfold. They, they were like wondering what to do. They want a king. They're in the promised land now. They're like crying. Uh, we want to be like everybody else. So then they asked for a king. So Samuel's instructed to go to this house of this guy, Jesse. And one of these sons are going to be king. He's got eight sons. He looks at them all. You know, some of them look like they were born to be king, man. Uh, big, strong guys. Tom Brady type guys, you know, like, wow, that guy looks like he belongs. And our Lord's like, don't, not him, not him. None of these. Are there any more? Like, yeah, yeah, I got this youngest out there tending sheep. Bring him in here. All right, that's the king right there. So God sees differently. He, he doesn't look at appearances. He looks into the heart. Uh, this is key, man, for salvation history, understanding. See, that uh, it never works out according to human thinking. And, and God has to teach that lesson over and over and over and over in salvation history. Even after they have this King David. And God promises uh, he's going to have a son one day. And who's going to receive an eternal throne. A Messiah, an anointed son of David is going to come. And I'm going to call him my son. We see that fulfilled in today's baptism of our Lord. Behold, my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. So it's like, yeah... What happens after 400 years of this Davidic dynasty? The tree gets chopped down by the Babylonians. So for 600 years or so, they're staring at a dead stump. Like, what's up with that prophecy? A thousand years from David to Christ. Before that prophecy of Nathan to David was fulfilled in 2 Samuel 7. A thousand years are as a day in the sight of the Lord, St. Peter says. What did they get? A dead stump. Five, six hundred years. Nothing but deportations, destruction, and domination of pagan nations for a thousand years before that. But God fulfilled that prophecy. In the end, his son did come. It didn't align according to human expectations. But God got it done. In his plan, his way, according to his purposes. So when are we going to learn to trust God's plan? People even today, they have expectations, you know. It's so funny. According to human thinking. I hear atheists and scoffers in contemporary times, you know, wag the finger at Almighty God. And say, you know, why did God create? I hear them say this type of stuff. How come God created this great, big, enormous cosmos? And it's just a big, black abyss. And it's devoid of life. It's, a, it's mostly hostile to us. If he's like the author of life and loves us so much, the Lord of life, why do we have this big vacuous cosmos all around us and no apparent life anywhere else in the universe that we can tell? It's just us on this little lonely speck of dust. If I was God, basically what they're saying, 
This doesn't line up with my expectations of how God should be. If I was God, I would do it a lot different, man. It'd be like Star Trek, Star Wars. You'd have like nations and people all over the place zipping around. Oh, it's kind of funny to me, honestly. It's a little entertaining to hear them say these types of things because that's what they're putting God to the test. Telling him what he should do. They're sitting in the back seat, leaning over the into the front seat, telling God what he should do, how he should have created the world, how he should have saved us. How come you chose a bunch of common, uneducated guys, a bunch of fishermen and stuff? Not a very good PR department God has. You know, they wag the figure, how come all the resurrection stories don't align in every little perfect detail? It's like they can't be satisfied by anything. Modern contemporary scoffers. How come Jesus didn't appear to everybody? You know, how come he just chose those select few? That's not how I would do it if I was God. I've heard him say that. I would appear to everybody. I'm so compassionate and loving. If I was God, wanted to save the world, rose from the dead, I would appear to everybody on the face of the earth for all time. So messed up. He only appeared to, you know, certain people at that time and place. How come he did it? Hey, look, man. We can't second guess. God did it the way he did it. And that's all we can do is receive what God has done. Accept his plan. Trust his plan and his purposes. Surrender our expectations. Let God be God. 